Right, so um, yes, my name is Kate Rogers, uh, and I am a PhD student at the University of Southampton. And my research for my thesis uh, explores the relationship between archaeology and documentary filmmaking. Um, so I look at the entire history of documentary filmmaking, but I've also done a survey of archaeologists' experiences of being on documentaries, which includes everything from you know the things we produce ourselves right through to you know massive television productions uh, and uh, and international films. Um, and I've also done an autoethnography of making a documentary on somebody's site and just recorded that process. Um, but one of the things that I want to talk about today is, uh, is looking ahead, looking to where documentary is going, uh, the wider documentary sector and how we as archaeologists can take advantage of that. So there's a kind of subgenre of documentary that is emerging at the moment, which is iDocs. Um, and it's been around for about 20 years. It's kind of kicked off very much in the last 10 years. Um, and I think it could be a really nice solution to some of the issues that we encounter in, uh, in archaeology when we are rubbing up against filmmaking or when we're trying to you know, share our information, share our data, and share the complexity of it. I think that iDocs could be a way forward. So if I go into it. Jumping straight in, what is an iDoc? Um, the definition that seems to be most common is that it's any project that starts with the intention to engage with the real. So as Kieran was talking about before, the real is actuality. It's an indexical relationship to what we know has actually happened, which is why we use actuality fit, uh, footage. Um, but it can also be audio. Uh, it's, a, it's a blurry, wobbly thing. Um, but that also uses interactive digital technology to realize this intention. So it has to be interactive. You have to, as the user, as the viewer, you have to have some degree of control. You're not just sitting back and watching something play out. Um, but there's a really nice maxim as well, which is by an anthropologist and filmmaker, Vasiliki Kansari, which is story first, technology second. So this is the other thing. It's very much a documentary, so story has to be the priority. Um, and the technology has to serve that story. So the way I like to think of storytelling is it's kind of like our argument when we're doing research design. It's the thread that ties all of the information together and the technology serves that. So one of the issues that I think we have with linear filmmaking, and this, it's the kind of filmmaking I've always done, so I'm not hating on linear filmmaking at all, uh, but, um, but you know, it has to work uh, in a certain way because that's the way the medium works. So it has a logic to it. Uh, it has to work in sequence. So each scene has to make sense in relationship to what has gone before and to what comes after it. And if you change that order, then the meaning and the argument changes. So that's what we mean when we're talking about linearity. And the consequence of this is that you know, you're, you're really restricted in the arguments that you can make and the interpretations that you can communicate in this format. Uh, so this is, I think, one of the issues that archaeologists have, is you know, we have really complex, nuanced, ambiguous information sometimes. And while, you know, when we're looking at a written page or at a map, we can sort of take it all in at once. But in film, you have to sort of experience it, and you have to experience it in real time. So if you're, you know, showing interviews, uh, you have to wait for those to play out. And then you have to kind of experience and, and think about it as it's happening. So it's a, it's a, in some ways, it is quite a limited medium, as powerful as it is. Um, it's also, yeah, as I mentioned, difficult to cross-reference. You can't cut through the information in the way you can, uh, for example, on a website. So iDocs bring in the best parts of documentary, so they, the emphasis on the real. Again, we trust what we see because we know that it, it represents reality. This is why documentary as a genre works, and it's why uh, film works in a legal situation if you have CCTV footage. We know that, yes, it's a construction, yes, there's a frame, but it also happened. There's a truth there um, that we can trust to some degree. Um, and then storytelling. So storytelling works uh, because, well, it's the, really one of the most powerful forms of human commu communication that we have. We care about characters, we care about character development, even if that character is a real person. And when we connect with characters, then we care about what happens to them. Um, and it, you know, it sparks off synapses in the brain and has all the positive brain chemistry which makes uh, a story memorable. So we're more likely to remember the information that is communicated to us when it is tied to a story. Um, and it's also persuasive. So again, this is why propaganda works. It's why um, uh, advertising works. 
it persuades us to believe something or persuades us to take an action. So this is all of the benefits that we have when we use storytelling. We're not just, you know, the, the thing that I was always, that was beaten into me at film school was, um, it's not a lecture with moving pictures. Uh, <laughs> if there's a story, we're going to remember it. It's going to make an impact. And then uh, what iDocs bring to the, uh, to the value of, uh, or the added value of iDocs is that it's an open access community. Um, people tend to share their code online. Uh, it's very experimental. Um, again, like I've, like I've said uh, or uh, mentioned, it's not linear, it's multi-linear in the way that it works. So we can have nuance, we can have depth of information. Um, there's an emphasis on co-creation and shared agency. So something that people were talking about before is, uh, you know, this sort of archaeologists feeling alienated sometimes from film, from filmmaking because, you know, they're not necessarily part of that process. But in iDocs, the way that it, the teams are structured is you have your filmmaker, your producer, your web designer, and your web, dev web developer, and your experts, and it's like maybe a team of six maximum, to, which is the core team. Um, and everybody's more or less equal, or at least that seems to be what people in the industry are saying. So people's voices are a little bit more represented, but also you bring in your audience as a co-creator and as a co-author, because your audience can remix within the platform. They can contribute information, whether that's audio or um, video or, or text or whatever, uh, and then they can share it on through social media. So your audience becomes your co-creator. And then there's a whole discourse about software also now being a co-creator. Um, and artificial intelligence as well. So there's a potential with iDocs to make film become more than a one-way communication tool. Um, we can crowdsource knowledge, construct and deconstruct and test our research questions within the platforms. We can test our methods and explore different outcomes. And to give you a sense of what I mean by multilinear storytelling, it can go in whatever way that you can code, basically. You're only limited by, by your coding and what the servers can take. Um, and so this is an example of storyboarding for one particular iDoc. So it starts out with the, um, I'm so sorry about the lighting, we don't really seem to have curtains. Uh, <laughs> so I hope it's clear. But um, you have your home page, you have your introductory video usually, which is like a teaser trailer, it sort of creates the world you're bringing people into, it sets up your contract with your audience, your menu page, and then you can't really see it, but there's actually lines connecting these in every single way. Um, so that your audience can navigate through. So that's one example of how that particular project has approached it. So I have a few case studies that I want to uh, show you. There are hundreds of iDocs available online now. Just if you look up iDoc, um, I think there's, a, there's an actual iDoc website, which is one of the communities who've been really helpful to me in my research. They have a list of iDocs, but I think uh, MIT Doc Lab is another, has a list of about 100 iDocs you can explore as well and see all the different ways people have put them together. But the first one I want to show you is The Last Hijack. So this is, uh, these, it, it's the independent documentary sector. So these are all social justice inclined because documentary tends to be that way. Um, and this one is about the end of uh, piracy in Somalia or the decline of piracy. Um, and it's done very well. It has a feature film, is, is half of the project, and then the iDoc or the interactive is the other half of the project. And it won an Emmy Award and a Free Europa for the iDoc. And it's in multiple languages, as you can see. So, oh, here we go. What I'm going to do is I'm, I did a screen kind of grab of, of the video. It's only half the story because it's visual. But I'm going to play it while I talk so that you can get a sense of how the interface works. OK, yeah, you can't really see it. Uh, <laughs> but um, basically what we have is you have your introductory video, like I mentioned. And then you come in to the main space where there's this timeline across the bottom. You can see it a little bit more, but here we are, which is before the hijack and afterwards. Um, so it's sort of like setting the scene, a particular hijack as a case study, and then the, you know, what's happened since. And you can navigate through, which I'm doing now in this, between six, there's actually eight different perspectives who all tell the story their own way. So you can navigate according to people. So we have our, our hostage, we have a pirate, we have uh, politicians and journalists, and we have security experts. Um, and you can just pick one person and follow them through, or you can contrast all of their accounts, all of the different stakeholders. Or you can travel through chronologically. Um, and you can also, up the top, if I jump forward, 
Oop, doesn't really want me to do it. Oh well, it'll come to it. Um, animation is used for to create the past to make it very clear that it's a reconstruction. So it's a very clear, clearly um, not reality, um, but related to and based on reality. And there's a lot of data which is involved as well. So you can there's a menu which you can flip to, and you can can. Uh, you can navigate through and play with uh, the history of hijacks in the entire region. You can read the statistics on each of them. You can follow the money flows over time. You can look at the way that the clans have changed over time, where the conflict zones are, how that has influenced it, and the history of illegal fishing. I would jump forward, but I'm not as good with this as I thought I was. Um, <laughs> but it will come to it. So you can see that you're cutting all these different components together to tell your story. And then right at the end, what's really nice is that you can actually also follow the citations through. So there's a list to all of the research that they've used and the websites, and you can follow that through uh, directly. So that's one example of an IDOC. And it's just a really nice example of multilinearity, really. Um, so if I move on, the next IDOC I want to mention is Seydanya, oh sorry, Seydanya. Uh, this is a pretty heavy one. This is a story about a particular prison in Syria. It's uh, co-produced by Amnesty International and Forensic Architecture, who are a, uh, they're kind of like a company which is part of the University of London um, goldsmiths, and they actually have an archeologist on their team which I thought was interesting, but they use architectural and acoustic modeling to create this model of, does that work? Oh no, you can't see my mouse. Uh, to create this model of the prison. Again, I'm going to let it play through. And that model, that 3D model, actually becomes the structure which the story is, is uh, embedded into. So you navigate through the story by navigating through the 3D structure. And if I play it, Again, you see that, that they open up with a video, which is a short film, which sets the scene. Again, it's very powerful music and narration. Um, and what they've done to put all of this together is they have... The, the issue with the prison is that it can only be seen through satellite imagery. Uh, and we can only understand what's going on inside of it through survivor testimony. So they can't, nobody can get access. Um, and so that's what Amnesty's whole campaign is is to lobby the Russian and US governments to allow, this, uh, to put pressure on the Syrian government, government to allow humanitarian monitors to come in and monitor the situation for the prisoners inside. So that's the whole campaign's aim. And the IDOC itself uh, aims to uh, create uh, attention and push, uh, it, you know, raise awareness for the user or for your audience members um, but really put pressure on them to then, you know, do what Amnesty does best, which is letter writing uh, <laughs> and lobbying to these governments. So the film is like the hook and it pulls you in, it informs you, and then it pushes you to write an, a letter. And throughout the IDOC, you, you know, you have these letters that pop up and you can just, you know, email off. Um, but again, we have two ways that we can navigate. So you can navigate according to uh, survivor's testimony, or you can navigate through the space itself. Uh, and you can, you, there are these pop out text parts. Uh, as you can see, I'm about to go to a particular individual's experience. Uh, and again, it opens up to a video which um, tells you how they've experienced uh, and survived this place. Um, and with, built into it is also how the model was created. Uh, so it's it's just a neat way of, of structuring storytelling, really, and something that I think is already explicitly archaeological because it's creating a place we can't access, we can't know about, and we have to use um, other means in order to understand what's what happened there. Uh, and again, we can't really nip forward with this. Um, oh. oh well. Um, So that building at the top, when you come out to this particular uh, wider view of the map, that building actually links to Amnesty's report. So you can also uh, navigate to the website and then download their official report. Um, so again, it kind of embeds the underlying research into the interface itself. 
Uh, and down the bottom here, you've got your social media accounts. So you can share the story and share your response to it on social media, which is, you know, one of the most important ways to get the story out there. So the other kind, awesome. the other um, main type of IDOC, which I think we really need to keep our eye on, is, uh, what's it called? If I go forward. It's personalized storytelling. Um, which is kind of timely to talk about with all of the stuff in the news about Google Analytica. Um, but basically what it is, is uh, I, I don't have a sample to show you. I did make them, but what they did is they regurgitated all my personal data, and it's not really appropriate to share that in a professional forum. So I'm just going to tell you what they do, uh, which is basically they create a story based on your personal data. You submit your data from Facebook, from your social media accounts, from your LinkedIn profile, from your emails, from your geolocation, some of them access your web camera, and they literally take that imagery and cut you into the story. Um, so they're kind of a little bit sit back because you don't navigate through them so much. Some of them have a little bit of interactivity. Really what they are is they, they sort of extract your information and cut it into a pre-made, very montage-esque um, film for whatever the agenda is. So um, Digital Me, which is this blue one. This is an old one. This is 2013 originally. Um, but you can actually have a conversation with your, your uh, digital clone, effectively. The version of you that exists in Facebook or the version of you that exists in Twitter. Um, and you can get to know what that version of you uh, thinks of you in return. Um, in, in Limbo, uh, in Limbo is about um, what happens to us digitally after we die and after we pass away? What is our digital ghost? How does it live on? Um, physically, where does it live on? Where are the computers that it exists in? And what happens to all of that information? Uh, and then the last one, which is newer, it's from, I think, last year, is Do Not Track, which is seven 30-minute episodes, which are all about uh, raising awareness and educating us about digital privacy. But it does this by, you know, by taking all your data. Uh, <laughs> and, and some of them are better at it than others. Some of them, you know, uh, part of the caveat is they will delete your data as soon as you leave the website. Some of it, you, you literally are handing over your data. But Do Not Track are quite clever about it. What they do is um, they use an algorithm uh, to go through your data and estimate everything from your sexual and political preferences uh, through to your... Um, your likelihood to qualify for a bank loan from their bank bank company that they have within the interface, um, and your likelihood to uh, qualify for health insurance from their fake health insurance company. Um, so again, if you've been following the story about Google Analytica, you know that this is very timely, uh, and this is a very important issue. These guys are trying to educate people about it, but they're also um, having a little bit of fun while they're doing it. Um, and there are many, many more examples. I think this is a sort of growing subgenre. And to me, oh, there's another one worth mentioning, which is vi uh, BBC's Visual Perceptive Media Project, which again is trying to experiment to make videos that actually respond to your personal preferences. So if you like a certain kind of music, they'll cut that music in without you having to select it. If they see from your account that you like a certain type of films, they'll use the color balance from those type of films. Uh, if they see that you have certain preferences for narratives, they will, you know, follow your, those biases. So that it's literally a different story for every single user. It's this incredible level of um, control slash openness at the same time. So all of this is happening, basically, as a story. And I, you know, to me, if I was to imagine an archaeological film using uh, personalization, the first thing I would imagine is if we sent one of our own digital clones back in time to a particular time or location, would they survive? How would they fare? I know that I would be dead um, <laughs> immediately, um, so I don't know how successful that would be. But this is, you know, this is where the industry is going. So I think it's something we need to keep in mind. Now, there are some obstacles with interactive documentaries we need to keep in mind if we want to use this. Firstly, uh, there's no stable uh, production tools. There's no single software. So we've mentioned today there's been quite a few people who've used Pe Premiere Pro. I use Avid. There's also, you know, all of these um, industry standards. That doesn't exist in interactive documentary. It's very much an open field. People are sort of feeling their way um, and, and making the software as they go along and keeping it up to date or not. 
Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is that the industry is very young. Um, it's only 20 years old, so the funding mechanisms aren't quite there yet. It can't quite compete with cinematic film yet financially. Um, and in terms of... Oh, but there are... It's worth mentioning that it is doing well on the awards circuit. So festivals are starting to give more space to interactive documentaries. They're winning uh, prizes. One has won a Pulitzer Prize. That was the NSA one. Um, others have won Emmy Awards. Uh, there is funding mechanisms in there. There are distribution channels that are coming out. There is support and interest in the industry. So there is ways forward, but it is something that you kind of have to figure out as you go along uh, and you have to work at it. It really would be a full-time job to do one of these. So what next for us, archeologists? Uh, something I would like to propose, and one of the ways which uh, a lot of these documentary uh, iDocs have come about is through hackathons. And maybe that's something we can get CAA involved in, or if that's not possible, maybe, you know, maybe we can just run our own hackathon at some point. Um, so this is the IFLAB hackathon. This is by the iDoc group. They actually have a conference about iDocs, but it's running right now in Bristol. So typically, and it's biennial, so we have to wait till 2020 for the next one. Um, but maybe we can hook up with them as well. Uh, and what it does is it brings teams together. Usually people aren't introduced until they meet, and you, so Point of View run a really nice IDOC uh, uh, hackathon as well. Um, and you kind of come out of them, you have a really intensive weekend, apparently lots of healthy food to keep you fueled. Um, and the point is to come out with an actual working prototype. So it's not just an idea on paper, you come out with something that you can then take on to try and get further development for and funding um, and see it through. And this is how quite a few um, iDocs have come about. So again, oh, you can't really see them. <laughs> but um, Empire is a really good one. They use film in all kinds of amazing ways. I wouldn't have thought of where you flip between perspectives literally just by a wave of the mouse. You're, you're, it's the same, same film, same soundtrack, but different perspectives visually. Um, Whiteness Project is uh, interview-based, lots of interview-based stuff in the iDocs. Unknown Spring is very artistic. Uh, you'll have to look these up and explore them. Um, but, oh, and Living Love Shores. Sh sure uh, actually is half made in 1984 because that's when the original film was made and then they've sort of recut it digitally. Al Jazeera has a really nice one as well where they've put up a lot of their old documentaries and users can come and literally recut those documentaries into their own stories and then share those on social media. So they have remixing platforms. So if you're interested, get in touch. Um, email me. Let me know if you would be interested in taking part of a hackathon. Um, because I would like to try and, and pitch one to CAA, see if we can get it off the ground. Um, and otherwise, uh, feel free to you know, explore iDocs yourself, look them up, see what's out there, spend some time playing with them, because uh, I do think that they are a solution for archaeology. I think we can, we can really uh, take them somewhere interesting. And uh, yeah, all my references, which you also can't read, but there you go.